Hey everybody, uh, good afternoon. I hope you've all been having a great day. Uh, for this next 15 minutes, we're gonna talk about Ray native data processing and ETL um, at the company I work at, City Storage Systems. Um, we also go by our actual company I work with, Cloud Kitchens, and this will all be using a new data frame API called Daft. Um, I'm a data scientist. I think this says ML engineer, but I call myself in a skill set more of data scientist modeling on that side. Um, so agenda for now, we're going to do a quick overview. I want to go over just a real world problem, sort of a proof of concept to see if this new data frame API works for us. Uh, very common problem people work with, NAD resolution. We're building a restaurant graph. So our company is sort of at the intersection of food tech and real estate. Uh, the previous solution we built is a Spark-based any resolution pipeline, and how we use Spark, uh, essentially replacing Spark with Ray plus Daft. So did we get similar performance? Did it integrate with our tech stack? How was it to work with? Uh, so the problem at a high level, I'm not going to go into super great detail, uh, we are sort of tasked with build a consistent source of, source of truth for the restaurant marketplace. So I want to know all the restaurants in the world. I want to know who's our customer, who's not our customer, what product they should be using. So this goes into sales optimization, uh, customer enrichment, marketplace analysis, where should we be putting stuff? We do a lot of spatial data analysis, and also some internal data validation. When you have siloed data, sometimes you find things like these don't link between these two data sources. Uh, this is just a toy example of entities we work with, brands, location, menu items. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. Some of the edges we know really well, it's our internal data. Some we don't know. We need to infer them. Um, so our previous solution, and one actually we're still shadowing or keeping in why we shadow the Daft solution, uh, was based on Spark. And at a high level, I don't want to go into too many details. If you've done any resolution, it can be a beast if you don't do it right and you can explode the problem. But you pre-process your data. You then try to figure out which records you want to compare in a fast way, in a scalable way. You compute similarity between them, or in some way you may generate, you can call this sort of your feature generation step. And then you might score them. This might be rules-based scoring, or this might be based on some ML model where you score. And you're essentially forming scores or weighted edges between these records. And then at some point, you're reconciling all those weighted edges into a final set of disjoint entities. Um, the real takeaway from this, we wanted efficient and scalable data processing for the solution. So we chose Spark. Um, why not any other data frame API? You know, our team mostly works in Python. Uh, it had proven scalability. We had already deployed Spark in our infrastructure, so it wasn't, we weren't going to get a lot of traction to say, hey, I want to run a DAS cluster. Um, we already had support within sort of our SDK we used to write the uh, pipelines in. Uh, this is Kubeflow pipelines. And Spark did have an extension graph frame, so it did have some graph support that might be useful down the line. Um, the rest of this you see down here is just sort of an overview of the tech stack that I used to sort of build this initial solution. And so what's the problem, right? If it's not broke, how do you convince, in a startup especially, I'm going to spend the next three months building an entirely new thing with different tools uh, and get probably the same solution. Like, we weren't saying we're going to get better entity resolution. Um, so the problem for us, and we've noticed in, on our ML infrastructure side, is there was pretty slow iteration. And it got even worse with Spark. Uh, we're a small team. So we ourselves were actually supporting all the Spark jobs, even the images below them. Um, it was a pretty high entry barrier. So beyond me, a lot of people would have a lot of trouble actually onboarding to this and getting used to deploying Spark jobs, monitoring them, going into Kubernetes and figuring out the logs for it, and very painful to debug. And obviously, for a lot of DSML, or I guess is what we call now AI type things, uh, you're probably going to do more complex UDFs. And more than likely or not, you're going to do something bad, and you're going to hit out of memory with those. And it can be a little tricky. Um, we're also very tied to our internal Java that's used for our standard services. So I had the fun time of when we updated Java 17 that I then had to upgrade Pi4j, and then I had to update PySpark, and then I had to update Hoodie. It just wasn't fun. So we worked with our ML infrastructure team. We said, OK, we kind of came across two different themes. One. Um, we want Python-first tooling. So one big change we made is we said, no more Bazel for Python. We're going to move everything into poetry. And the next thing was unified compute. So as we started migrating a lot of this tooling, one was poetry, one was Metaflow, the question came up, people are interested in using Ray for model training and tuning. We don't have the resources to support both Spark and Ray. 
could we somehow use Ray to just do everything? And this is where DAF comes in. So from their website directly, I'm just going to read it. It's easier than paraphrasing. It's a distributed query engine for large-scale data processing in Python. Uh, under the hood, it's implemented in Rust. Why are we talking about it at Ray? Uh, their primary integration is Ray to actually do this in a distributed way. Um, some other highlights, uh, it's using Apache Arrow format under the hood, uh, pretty easy to work with. Uh, it's a lazy evaluation data frame API. They are targeting multimodal support, and they know that everyone wants to be cloud native and also have some data catalog support like uh, Apache Iceberg. And here on the right-hand side, I'm just showing you example syntax. So this is not actual code we're using in anything. This is just give you a flavor that the API itself feels very much like Spark. So if you had to transition over to it, it's not going to be a big surprise. Now, there are some differences. It's not word for word from a Spark API. Um, they've made changes that they felt were best for their API. Why test on this project? Uh, we could just say because I was a willing guinea pig that said, just give me the time. I'd love to try this. Um, but really, if you look at this full pipeline, we kind of have a, a flavor of everything. Uh, we have some custom transformations we do on, on ingestion and also when we do scoring. We have to do some joins and shuffles when we do blocking stage. It already is using a lot of our tech stack, uh, Iceberg and Metaflow. Um, so it seemed like a good project to say, you know, sort of dog food this and figure out does it work. And I was the guinea pig that said, was it easy to migrate and actually do the same thing? And did I feel like I was actually getting more efficiency? Um, so from a performance standpoint, we looked at transformations. Uh, DAF team is going to give some, you know, we'll give their benchmarks on more standard transformations. As you know, in our cases, we're kind of doing more complicated things sometimes. So for example, we use uh, this open source library, libpostal, that parses unstructured address data when we get external data about restaurants. Uh, we have someone built a cuisine classification inference model. We'd love to apply that in here. And it's using, you know, BERT and a TensorFlow model under, underneath it. Uh, we do some additional location data enrichment. Um, so how does Daft handle this? Looks very much like Spark. You have a standard UDF, um, which I'm showing here, which is just taking some lat longs and converting them to an H3 index, which is a spatial index system. And they also have what they call stateful UDFs. And it's very similar to what you can kind of get in Ray's map batches. You can initialize some very expensive thing at the beginning. I need to load in my libpostal data, and then I go through and I parse my addresses. Or I need to load in my models, and then I'm going to run prediction with my cuisine inference model. Um, so we originally tried this. Obviously, bet ver the BERT vectorizer on these very large menus, it could be hundreds to even up to like 1,000 menu items, it was saturating CPU. We didn't run it on GPU. We took a very modest cluster, 10 workers, and we were getting you know, 100,000 records per minute. Took about three to, gig, three to five gigabytes per task, because libpostal takes about two to three gigs every time you load it in on each instance. Um, this was a net new thing we tried. We didn't even bother to try to do something like this in Spark. Um, and we thought it'd be an interesting thing, something net new that we didn't have anything to work from. Could we actually just implement it from scratch? It worked. Um, and you know, the scale itself, obviously, it's not super fast, so to give you something more realistic in terms of throughput, um, when we do scoring, we had trained a model also on Ray, just using Ray Train and Ray Tune, um, to score the weighted edges. And essentially, we had the same setup, 10 workers, and you know, we could process 3 million records a second under that. Um, much, more, much lower memory usage per task, because obviously this boosted model is much smaller when it was actually loaded into each instance. Um, Daft also has a beta feature to improve stateful UDFs via what they call actor pool projections. Um, they could probably tell you more about that. I don't want to go into too many details to save us time. Uh, the setup of the UDF I have here is before they actually implemented stateful UDFs. This might be how you do it in Spark, right? You kind of wrap it in a factory so that your, your model's inside of that, and then you run prediction. Um, you could easily change this just to be a stateful UDF instead. Um, for the join step, so blocking or indexing is really like, let me find some features that I can very quickly whittle down what is important to me. We deal with a lot of spatial data, specifically what restaurants are close to each other. Uh, the way we did it in Spark and the way we do it in Daft is we actually just use uh, in this H3 spatial index library, and we use what's called a K-ring to approximate a radius. And the, the join is actually very simple. Uh, you just end up exploding the K-ring on one side and joining it, and you essentially get everything within one K-ring of each other. Uh, this is an interesting joining because you can start with a small number of records, let's say 2 million, and then it explodes out to 500 million records. And this is just like a subset of our data. 
Um, one interesting thing to note here, and things you probably run into in Spark, is sometimes you have to do some manual partitioning because Spark's not smart enough to know my data is going to explode in some way. Um, we had to do the same thing with Daft, although to be honest, I did not have to do this in Spark because I think AQE has gotten a little bit smarter in terms of estimating, like, you know, how big is your data going to be in memory, or how how you know is this explosion expected? 500 million. Uh, Using the same Ray cluster size, we could generate this 500 million in less than five minutes. Looking at the throughput of the scoring before, which is like three million per second, we can also do all the scoring of each of our candidate pairs in less than five minutes in this case. Um, for integrations, we needed it to integrate with all of our tooling. Uh, the team has been putting a lot of work into read and write support. Uh, they utilize PyIceberg under the hood. Uh, it is not as fully featured as Spark's API, so we're talking about merge into schema evolution, but we are able to wrap Daft and PyIceberg APIs to effectively uh, get to that stage. Uh, as we adapted Metaflow, our ML Enfer team actually built custom uh, plugins for it so that we could easily package up our entire local and third party dependencies and then ship them off to a Ray cluster let it run, it just sits there and waiting, and then once it finishes, it says, okay, I can go on to the next step, and that's what this example Metaflow pipeline is showing. Um, so my sort of initial conclusions of dog fooding this, for this specific sort of, not huge example, but a real life example that we needed to run in a scalable way, it ran fine on similarly sized resources. But it did require some additional tuning when he did move stuff over. And I would be lying if there were some days I said, man, can I just use Spark in this new environment? Um, can we easily integrate it to our stack? The answer was very much yes. I wasn't dealing with jars to say, do I have the right jar so I can write, read and write from S3? Do I have the right Hive Metastore jars? It just kind of just worked. Uh, but the Iceberg API was slightly incomplete. Uh, easy to migrate. The syntax was similar, as you could see. And the UDF support kind of made it relatively easy. It's just there is some functionality gaps, and it's because Spark has been around a long time. So for example, window functions, still in process in the works. So I had to modify some of my code to actually support that. Uh, did it improve my efficiency? So one thing I really like, local executor support. So no need to start up a Ray cluster to actually try stuff local. You can write your unit tests without worrying about you know, configuring it so that you actually have something running. Uh, no Java. Really, it's not about Java here. It's the fact that I didn't have to think about Rust while I was writing in Python, right? You weren't thinking about, uh, do I have the right jars to handle this specific thing? Minus the occasional PyO3 panic that would show up in error traces sometimes, but that was usually my fault. Uh, very responsive team. They're very friendly. I bug them all the time. Uh, I said, please, please give me partition write support in PyIceberg. Uh, they're waiting. Uh, in Iceberg, they were waiting for PyIceberg team to do it, and finally I said, you know what, we'll do it, we'll build it, and they, and they did with all the supported transformations. Uh, again, efficiency, when you're missing functionality, you're going to have to do workarounds. If you have to do workarounds, it's probably going to require more time. Uh, Ray plus DAF specific, so Ray runtime environments are really useful here. Uh, it just shortens the startup time, right? So if you can cache your runtime environment, it works. Uh, scaled seamlessly, there is no dedicated UI. You're depending on the Ray UI in this case instead of a Spark UI. And we're still going, you know, we're using dedicated auto-scaling Ray clusters right now via Kubray, but these jobs expect isolation, so we may need transient clusters. Um, so that was my experience with it. I hope this gives you an idea of, like, if this would be an interesting thing you want to try. Uh, thank you.